Hello everyone and welcome to yet another episode of Real History. I am Jared Frederick and uh, today I'm pleased to be uh, reacting to and analyzing episode 4 of the HBO miniseries Band of Brothers which is entitled Replacements. Where we left off Easy Company last time is that uh, they had just arrived back from their first trial by fire in Normandy. They were getting a little bit of R&R &R in England. And uh, this episode will put us in the midst of their preparation for their next great campaign of the war, which would be codenamed Operation Market Garden. And so, without further ado, let's go ahead and take yet another look at Band of Brothers. GIs could have quite the colorful time in these English pubs around Aldbourne, Ramsbury, uh, these very uh, picturesque uh, little communities in which they were generally very warmly treated. And uh, on occasion, they could uh, also get a little bit of uh, time to explore the exciting streets of London. And uh, this episode is called Replacements, and it speaks to this new generation of members of Easy Company. Um, some of whom were, I suppose, sometimes uh, rather coolly treated by uh, these veterans who had seen combat. Um, a lot of time these young men were seen as boyish soldiers who seemed prime candidates for early graves. Um, but, you know, as we see here, that was not the case with everybody, certainly. Um, if you could find a comrade who came from the same town or area as you, they would often sometimes take you under their wing. Um, and that was certainly the case in regard to the relationship between Bill Garnier and Edward Babe Heffron, who both hailed from the city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Oh, no. Embarrassing the lieutenant here. Have a drink. Oh, don't mind if I do, Sarge. I start winning money soon. I think your buddies are starting to miss you. Garnier and Heffron particularly enjoyed their various adventures into London when they might get a weekend pass. Uh, they would often try to uh, score dates uh, with the local women. Sometimes they had luck, sometimes they didn't. Um, on one occasion where they did have luck, though, uh, they didn't get back to barracks until 4 a.m. And uh, Bill Garnier was punished with uh, KP to uh, duty, kitchen patrol. Uh, but he ended up uh, lucking out because on that very same day, uh, the company ended up doing uh, a forced march with full packs. And he was very contented to uh, be peeling potatoes uh, rather than uh, going out into the, the rather dreary English countryside on a forced march. Um, and so uh, that was the sort of uh, luck that Bill Garnier had uh, throughout uh, many of his uh, experiences. Hey, see. Yeah, right. <laughs> what are you laughing at? A very young, almost high school age looking James McAvoy here who was uh, on the eve of hitting the big time. Definitely one of his breakout roles here in Band of Brothers, as it was for a lot of the actors who would star in this series. This is called Operation Market Garden. In terms of airborne divisions involved, this one's even bigger than Normandy. After the fall, or uh, the, rather the liberation of Paris in mid-August of 1944, there was a lot of optimism among the, the ranks of Allied commanders and leaders. There was a sincere hope that the war could possibly be over by Christmas. And rather than adopting the strategy of a broad front that would move across Western Europe in unison, uh, General Dwight Eisenhower opted for a plan that was proposed and heavily advocated by British General Sir Bernard Law Montgomery. And uh, what this advocated was the dropping of uh, British, American, and uh, Polish paratroopers and glider troops into Nazi-occupied Holland. Uh, with the hope of uh, forging a bridgehead uh, across the Rhine River uh, and working their way into the heart of Germany accordingly. It was a, a very ambitious plan. Its success would be predicated upon uh, speed, efficiency, and logistics.
there's not a lot of background given about the backstory uh, that this motorcycle that Don Malarkey and Alton Moore are driving through the English countryside, but there's a rather a comical tale uh, behind it. Uh, Alton Moore had uh, essentially stolen this motorcycle at a motor pole uh, near Utah Beach when they were still in France. And he asked Lieutenant Compton, uh, if I can, you know, get that motorcycle aboard the LST, the ship that's going to take us back across the channel, um, is that okay? And uh, Compton essentially said, if you can get it aboard the ship, I don't care. Um, and so, lo and behold, when their ship arrives back in England, uh, as uh, the regiment was being transported back to its home barracks, if you will. Uh, the regiment took a train, but uh, Malarkey and Moore uh, rode their motorcycle back across the English countryside to the Aldbourne area. Um, and so um, it's a lot more than a joyride. It's in many ways a stolen joyride. September 17th, 1944 started out uh, rather uh, foggy in England, uh, but the day's weather uh, really improved and uh, it stood in, in sharp contrast to D-Day in, in France just a, a few months earlier. Um, it was, uh, by all accounts, a beautiful late summer day. Uh, the sun was out. The resistance initially was not as fierce as far as anti-aircraft fire or ground fire uh, was concerned. Um, some men uh, landed uh, square in their drop zones without a, a shot having been fired at them. Colonel Robert Sink, the regimental commander of the 506th, uh, was not as fortunate in his plane uh, because one of the wings of his aircraft was shot off. And he calmly turned to the fellow troopers who were on his plane and he said, well, there goes our wing. And uh, thanks to some uh, very apt uh, control by uh, the, the airmen, uh, they were able to all get out in time. Uh, but even despite instances like that, the, the initial jump ran a lot smoother. One thing that really concerned Dick Winters uh, as uh, the men were dropping um, is that all of this loose equipment was flying off them. You know, hundreds of pounds of gear in every direction, uh, raining down. And, uh, you know, he was just as concerned about being hit by a loose rifle falling from several hundred feet um, as much as he was an enemy bullet in moments like that. Um, and so it, it just speaks to the, really the, the logistical multitude of, of all of this um, as these troopers are being dropped into Holland. I think I love Holland. <laughs> Where'd you get these? That farmhouse over there. The division history written immediately after the war, uh, a really wonderful and thick and detailed book entitled Rendezvous with Destiny, uh, said that uh, Holland is as flat as the proverbial pancake. And uh, as a result, it was a very waterlogged country, um, even uh, more marshy and boggy than what Normandy had been. And it was intersected by these elevated roadways and dikes uh, that connected town to town. And uh, this too could often prove problematic for uh, navigation, finding the enemy, and attacking the enemy. As Americans entered these Dutch communities, uh, this is the, the visual gesture uh, that they were often greeted with. Uh, and that was these orange banners that were being used to uh, represent and celebrate the liberation of communities like Eindhoven, which we see here. 
Uh, the 506th Regiment was tasked with capturing a number of bridges at Eindhoven and a nearby canal bridge um, in the neighboring community of Son. And when they arrived in Eindhoven, uh, here too was something that was in major contrast to what they saw in Normandy. In a lot of cases, uh, civilians in Normandy were very reserved. They were reticent to, you know, go out into the streets and party. They were rather cautious about what was going on. And uh, certainly that was not the case here in Eindhoven. Uh, winners, um, you know, while he enjoyed the celebration to an extent, he also saw it as a major problem because it created a big bottleneck. What's up, Welsh snipers? We've got to get to these bridges. In this scene here, um, a nice subtlety that the film gets right that most people wouldn't even notice uh, is that you see Winters turning up his collars and he shoves his binoculars down beneath his M43 jacket. And um, this is not just some, you know, uh, slight, um, you know, modification of his uniform. He did that because he wanted to conceal his rank, make sure that German snipers couldn't see that. Uh, binoculars, field glasses, were also seen as something symbolic, um, something typical that officers would carry. Winters also had his map case sewn into the back of his jacket rather than more obviously carrying around uh, a map case. I mean, you can see a lot of these artifacts on display at the Gettysburg Museum of History, and uh, likewise you can uh, see those artifacts showcased in uh, my book, which I co-authored uh, with my friend Eric Dorr, who is the curator of the Gettysburg Museum of History. Go check it out. You can see a lot of really cool stuff there. Um, but in short, Winters did not want to make himself a target. A lot of officers carried only sidearms. He carried an M1 rifle. He wanted to be able to defend himself, and he did not want to be conspicuously identified as a captain. Sergeant Talbert, let's move. We got work to do. In these scenes in Eindhoven, we also see the real life Babe Heffron, um, who was one of the many veterans who uh, visited the set during production in England. So uh, another nice little Easter egg that we see hidden in here. They slept with the Germans. Mr. Van Kork here is with the Dutch Resistance. We've been the Dutch Resistance were uh, very valuable assets for people like Lewis Nixon, uh, you know, whose responsibility it was to obtain ob intelligence uh, you know, that offered, you know, perspective, you know, where are the Germans, what are their strengths, where are they located, uh, when was the last time they came through this area. All of this was the manner of material in which officers were seeking out. And uh, the Dutch resistance uh, tended to be very capable in the accumulation of that intelligence. Among all the traffic that got stuck in Eindhoven uh, were Bailey bridges, uh, the, these artificial bridges that needed to span, you know, these various waterways uh, that, that the Allies needed to cross to get to their ultimate destination. And uh, once night came, um, Eindhoven was bombed eventually, and uh, a lot of those vehicles um, and bridge equipment were still in the streets of Eindhoven and those ended up being incinerated with a bunch of other things. Um, and so this, this log jam from the very get-go proves very problematic for the Allied advance. It's one of the really kind of nice and tender moments uh, in the film uh, and it offers us, uh, as the audience, a, a little bit of a break from all of the carnage and, and intensity of these various campaigns. You know, it really, you know, speaks to 
the emotional power of liberation. And uh, I think it also highlights, you know, things that we might otherwise take for granted, something like a bar of chocolate, things that a kid growing up in an occupied country would not have had. Um, and so a wonderful little moment there that we see in regard to uh, the character of David Webster. Here at Noonan is where uh, the 506th Regiment uh, would uh, soon be caught in, in one of the, the very desperate fights to take place um, along this road that ominously became known as Hell's Highway. Um, an ultimate objective of these various American units pushing north through the Netherlands was to relieve beleaguered British paratroopers who were holding and uh, you know, attempting to uh, maintain uh, their foothold at a bridge at Arnhem. And uh, the effort to reach them was a very tumultuous one indeed, as we are soon to find out. They get along to General Penn. What the hell's he doing? He's good. Lieutenant! This lieutenant that we just saw being shot here through the neck uh, was, uh, this was a real life incident uh, that Dick Winters wrote about. Uh, the lieutenant's name was Bob Brewer. And on more than one occasion, uh, Winters told him, you know, don't go far out ahead of your men. Don't make yourself such an obvious target. Uh, he told him this on a number of occasions, and uh, unfortunately, uh, Brewer neglected that advice here in the outskirts of Neunen. And uh, Brewer did survive his wounds, in fact. This encounter was very dazing because, um, uh, to a large extent, uh, these Americans had, you know, been very warmly greeted. Uh, the landscape was very scenic, very idyllic, uh, as the character of, of Webster pointed out in an earlier moment. Um, these were the landscapes that were captured by Impressionist painters, you know, just 50 or 60 years prior. Um, but that idyllic landscape was soon to change into something far more dreary and deadly. Once again here, you can see where the production designers just really did their homework. Um, there is a distinct architectural difference between a lot of the dwellings that you find in Normandy versus those in Holland. And um, the, the very large and encompassing set uh, built in England for these various scenes were constantly being altered. Um, but you really can't tell um, as a member of the audience. Um, and so. Uh, the, the big 100 plus million dollar budget uh, used to create this series, um, a lot of that was dedicated to creating these very authentic sets, and it really shows. I can't. My orders are no unnecessary destruction of property. Are you staying or going? This scene really underscores the friction that often existed between American paratroopers and British tankers who were often intended to accompany them. Uh, you have instances like this where perhaps uh, the British did not want to uh, heedlessly destroy any private property. Um, something that paratroopers complained even more about though was the fact that these British gunners and tankers were always taking tea. They would have tea three or four times a day. Um, and, you know, as one paratrooper said, you know, like the war is essentially paused when <laughs> these Brits have to, you know, have their, their tea. Um, and so uh, that was definitely a point of contention. In another instance, um, in the nearby community of Uden, um, which uh, the series doesn't really get into, um, Winners, who was uh, defending the town with his men, uh, became really riled up uh, against a British lieutenant um, whose tanks were parked outside. And the lieutenant was inside, you know, uh, you know trying to schmooze with um, a Dutch woman. 
And uh, as, as Winters later said in his memoirs, he didn't do much to build a sense of collegiality in the Alliance that day after he really rang out that lieutenant's ear. Denver Bull Randleman was this uh, tough-as-nails paratrooper from Arkansas, uh, appropriately named Bull because of his large size and strength. And uh, he was indeed uh, hit in the shoulder by a piece of exploding tank, as, as we see here. Um, at the time of production, uh, Bull Randleman was uh, still alive. Um, Unlike uh, some of the characters depicted, he, he got to see the end product uh, on screen and uh, he survived this very close call uh, that we see here and uh, he lived to the year 2003. Who's in these scenes, several real-life episodes of combat that took place in a number of villages are condensed really into a singular episode. And um, you know, this speaks to uh, one of uh, the factors uh, that, that executive producer Tom Hanks uh, mentioned after the series came out. Um, he said, you know, that history had to fit in our television screens. Um, characters were going to be condensed, uh, as were uh, various episodes of, of combat and uh, the trials of Easy Company. And uh, certainly, uh, these depictions of combat in Holland uh, fit within that category. You simply can't cover it all. Um, the combat along Hell's Highway was uh, very contentious. It was very continuous. There are entire uh, towns and actions uh, that are left out of the series, and understandably so. You just simply can't cover it all. How bad? I don't know yet. Next! I'm all right. I'm all right. This is the close call that uh, Lewis Nixon had uh, here amidst this fighting during Market Garden. Um, some fragment, perhaps a ricochet, uh, it did strike his helmet um, and uh, luckily for him it left nothing more than a bruise on his head. Uh, Lewis Nixon was one of those uh, really uh, unique characters uh, in regard to Easy Company uh, because he, he never actually fired his weapon in combat. He was one of the few men in the company who did not receive a Purple Heart for being wounded. Uh, but yet at the same time, by the end of the war, he had more combat jumps um, than almost all other men in Easy Company as well. And so it's a very unique dynamic here that we see with this uh, one officer in the company. It was in moments like this where the Allies realized the hard way that the Germans had a lot more fight left in them than what they perhaps anticipated. Uh, there was a, a misassumption on the part of some Americans and British uh, that you know, the ranks of the German army uh, at this point you know, were largely comprised of you know, uh, younger men, non-veterans, uh, perhaps even older Germans pressed into service. Uh, and, you know, they, they realized in a, a rather difficult way uh, that uh, the enemy was still very fierce and contentious. I'll go. Me too. All right. What the hell? I ain't going back up there. And, of course, the poetic irony in that scene is that, uh, you know, uh, the veteran seems more reticent than the replacements uh, to go up and to search for, you know, this missing comrade. You know, little scenes like this, I think, are in many ways rather profound because, you know, when you think about how many civilians and uh, people who provided aid to these liberators. You know, how, how many people that these soldiers encountered? Um, and they often never got their names. They didn't know who they were. Um, but these brief interactions often had 
a lasting impression upon these veterans as they recounted the war in years later. Bombing Eindhoven. Yeah. And of course here we see Eindhoven being bombed and uh, all the problems that I previously mentioned therein uh, were endured in a very harsh way. Um, over a thousand people in Eindhoven were killed and wounded during the, the bombing uh, of that night. Um, and so, you know, war did not discriminate between civilian and soldier. They would indeed encounter more tanks and more resistance in the days to come. Uh, these opening clashes that we saw in this episode were really only the beginning of a very dreary weeks-long campaign taking place in the Netherlands. I don't like retreating. There's time for everything. Throughout the fall of 1944, the 506th Regiment uh, moved from one town to the next and they eventually found themselves on a patch of land near the Rhine River that was known as the Island. And it is there in early October of 1944 that our next episode will commence. We'll see you then.